Hey, Macro Musings listeners. Today's episode features Kevin Erdman and is a replay of a show from last year. We are rerunning it because the book featured in the show is now officially out. The book's title is Shut Out by Kevin Erdman. For those interested, there is a link in the show notes for a discount code for purchasing the book. Now on to the show. Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Kevin Erdman. Kevin is the author of a new book titled Locked Out. How the Shortage of Urban Housing is Wrecking Our Economy. He joins us today to discuss his new book. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hi, David. It's great to be here. All right. Well, fun to have you on. You've got a very provocative new book that's going to reshape the narrative. At least that's your hope and your dream. (laughs) You're going to change our views. And you're here to convince myself and our listeners today that our views about the housing recession are wrong in many ways. And you're going to fix them. But before we get into the book, tell me, how did you actually get interested in this topic and what led you to write the book? Uh, yeah, you know, the, this whole uh, project has been sort of an accident. Um, I, it, it's been really a three year process at this point. And uh, my first sort of baby steps into it was I was just sort of managing personal investments and whatnot and, and doing independent research and had some ideas about you know, the home builder market, maybe some tactical investments you could make there back in like 2014, 2015. Um, and, and my, the original germ of the idea was that, oh, we, there's been this big decline in home ownership. There's probably sort of a regime shift in the market from a homeowner price point to a, a landlord price point that as that reverses, maybe there were some tactical gains to be made there. So the, the original, my original sort of, uh, ways of looking at it was, okay, you know, there's going to be some bounce back, but, but since we had all this excess in 2004 and five, I need to sort of look at the data and, and figure out how much of that pendulum swing was just going back to neutral, how much has been an overswing just for, for personal investment, uh, you know, strategies. So I would go look at, say, the survey of, um, consumer finance, uh, or, um, you know, any sort of data like that, census data on home building. And so I like survey of consumer finance. I go look and there's nothing, there was no pendulum swing. There was never a shift downward in, uh, uh, home buyer, uh, you know, incomes or FICO scores. All those measures were pretty level throughout the boom. Uh, and so, you know, for, I don't know, six months or a year, uh, I, well, I originally, maybe planned on spending a month on this and then figuring out what I wanted to do in the market and go from there. Uh, but every time I'd look at a new piece of data, it would be nothing. There'd be nothing there that was supposed to be there. So for, you know, a long time, it, every few days I'd come down to dinner and tell my wife, you won't believe this, but you know, home ownership rates were declining during the subprime boom. Isn't that a crazy thing? Like what, you know, that doesn't make any sense, right? Or, so was your wife engaging on this? Because, you know, I, I may get in trouble saying this, but I can't always get my wife to get excited about nominal GDP yeah. targeting and safe <laughs> yeah. asset problems. Yeah. Are you telling me your wife really is like, really, dear? And kind of <laughs> well, end up. Well, I think it's sort of come back to bite. She originally had suggested blogging things. And by this time, I was blogging these yeah. ideas. And and so her original idea was he'll tell us blog readers about it and stop bothering me about <laughs> okay. it. Okay. But, but eventually it sort of ended up being now I'm in this three year obsession and, and now she has to hear about it anyway, right? <laughs> okay. So she tolerates but, you. Yeah. And you're, okay. Yeah. But yeah. continue your story. Yeah. So, you know, it was sort of accident. I, it, it was, uh, you know, just this process. Every th- time I would look at the data, everything was backwards or just non existent from, from, the premises that all the different people arguing okay. about what happened agreed on these premises and the premises aren't anywhere in the data. Um, and so eventually it just became, you know, sort of just, I accidentally took baby step, baby step, baby step. And a year into it, here I am with this, with this, uh, big pile of data and, 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 you know, sort of starting to form a, a new way of looking at the framework of it. And, and so, you know, at that point it's like, well, I, I guess this is, this is why, why am I the guy that found this? Right. But here I am. And so I guess this okay. is what I'm doing now. <laughs> now. Also to complete the story, Scott Sumner, my colleague, my yeah. boss here, yeah. 
and many of our listeners know the author of The Money Illusion. He started reading your blog, right, or posting yes, good written. Somehow yes. he found you, mm-hmm. and he found it interesting, and then he yeah. asked you to write a book about this. Is that how it went? Uh, well, the, I'd say the book idea sort of – there was a, a, a longtime reader of the blog that, that was supportive of it and uh, and sort of uh, encouraged okay. me to, to okay. come to Mercatus. But Scott and I and Tyler had sort of a pre-existing relationship from the blogosphere, right? It really, this whole okay. thing – you know, none of this could have happened before the blogosphere, before, you know, that I, that I could sit in my loft in right. my pajamas and download <laughs> yeah. census data, right? And, um, uh, so, and really that pre-existing relationship had a lot to do with the, the you know, that the uh, market monitorist sort of idea that there was a, a recession that was, that came out of Fed policy decisions that was separate from the housing bubble, I think sort of was an intellectual foundation that I was stand, you know, that all made sense to me. So sort of intellectually, I was, I was open to the idea that, okay. that, that the story was a little bit different. And then I think just coming from that, uh, in investor sort of tactical investor point of view that I had of sort of a, uh, trust, but verify, um, a viewpoint toward efficient markets. Um, uh, I think sort of, uh, gave me sort of permission to, uh, you know, in effect, I was approaching this market in the same way I would approach what you would normally only find in a little illiquid, uh, uh, micro, uh, cap stock, uh, where things, you know, where people's perceptions were wrong and you could find mispricings. But, but when you're doing that, when you're engaged in that sort of work, you have to be very disciplined and 99% of the stuff going on, you, you, you assume is efficient or you, you know, and, and you find little things that look efficient, inefficient. But then you have to be very disciplined about, you know, look, most of the things that look inefficient really are efficient and it's me that's the, that's wrong, right? And, and that's sort of the process I took down this pathway of, okay, that's weird. The perceptions seem wrong, but I really need to confirm this. And I've spent three years trying to, you know, trying to prove right. myself wrong. And, and here I am. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't. And just... now you have a book called Locked mm-hmm. Out and how it really was a story of housing shortage that drove the boom. And even what we see today, and really what's interesting about your book is it kind of weaves together, and we'll come back to this in more detail, but it weaves together a lot of the discussions today about NIMBYism, the shortage of housing in urban areas. But what your your book does, it shows that this story that people are paying attention to today was really part of the story back then as well. But let's let's go ahead and get into your book. And let's begin by kind of getting the executive summary from you, and then we'll work out some of the details. But give us the overview of the of your argument. Yeah. So I, what I would say is, you know, there's this housing shortage problem. Uh, you know, I'd say writ large, it's basically sort of we're in like this new epoch. We're in this new era of where urban. It's a new. There's a new wave of urbanization that's really required. Uh, just by the state of technology, the state of culture, the state of the economy today. There's, you know, this new post-industrial, um, you know, non-manufacturing based, service based economy. And so at the core of that are, are the, the sort of innovative workers in tech fields and finance. And, you know, they're centered in, in trade. So they're centered in New York City and Boston and San Francisco and LA. And, you know, you, you can see the same thing internationally. There's London and Sydney. Uh, you know, all these cities are sort of dealing with this immovable force and unstoppable uh, or mm. what is it? unstoppable force and immovable right. object problem where these cities suddenly have this tremendous value for those workers. They need to be close to one another to be involved in skunk works and relationship building. And, and po- politically we've evolved to a position where locals have so much control over what happens in the rest of the city that we, you know, we're not building tenements in Manhattan anymore. So uh, that was probably a, a you know, a swing too far in a direction by today's standards in terms of building, you know, housing that was unhealthy or whatever. But the pendulum has sort of swung far in the other direction today at a time where urbanization is really valuable. Uh, and, and so the, the, te- the, the innovation workers are probably the core of that. But the second part of that is, is the service economy that sort of, that sort of comes along for the ride there, you know, and so we have this problem throughout the country of people, uh, who have say lost their jobs in the manufacturing sector, um, and and a lot of labor immo- immobility that comes from that, 
and uh, or that's sort of making that problem worse, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So workers are sort of stuck in cities with high unemployment, and they're not moving toward places that have more opportunity. Well, the the reason that's I, what I think I found is the reason that not, that's not happening. And I think there's a lot of agreement and understanding about this is that. They can't move to those. So, you know, where they would move is they would move to Manhattan or to San Francisco and be a, a barista or a nurse or a teacher or something serving these core, uh, labor pools of the innovative workers that are sort of the income source in those cities, right? Uh, and they're sort of locked out, you know, the, the title of the book, the working title of the book, locked out. The, those service sector workers can't, are, the, 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 they can't the, afford to move there because exactly. of the limited supply of housing. Yeah, and so and we call those the non-tradable sectors, right? right. And, and you know, by definition, those are those are jobs that have to be close to their customer. That's what keeps them from being bid away to right. to other markets. And these ha- local housing policies are the source of obstruction that keeps that transition from happening. Now, I think uh, what you know. I think in today's context, there's sort of a broad agreement that that's happening. Uh, I think the the data I found basically says, well, you know, everyone uh, uh, agree- seems to also agree that we had millions too many homes in 2005. Well, that's a sort of a weird thing to to have to tack on to this, you know, problem that we have today that there's not enough housing and that's right. the obstruction. So what I found is there actually has never been too much housing. All along, our problem has been a lack of housing, especially in those particular cities. And uh, and so once we remove that, uh, to me, it's sort of a virus in the national conversation. We remove that virus, and then everything makes more sense. Everything actually becomes much more coherent in terms of thinking about the problems, uh, uh, you know, that are keeping the econo- economy from being more vibrant over a couple of decades. Um, and so, so we look back at 2000, say 2005, you know, um, so I, uh, Ben Bernanke in, uh, in 2006, his first meeting at the Fed, uh, he comes away, you know, in his memoir, he talks about how they felt like it was a, a successful, uh, meeting because they'd finally raised interest rates enough to start to sort of pull down residential investment because we had this overhang of supply that everyone thought we had. Well, that the the, the year leading up to that meeting, uh, there were probably I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but probably three hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand households that were piling out out of those cities, out of New York City, Boston, San Francisco, and L.A. The cities with the highest income potential in the country, you know, cities that are the centers of kind of the new prosperity. Uh, hundreds of thousands of households were moving out of those cities for lack of a house. Right. Um, and so they were sort of moving into second best alternatives in other cities. Um, but their problem wasn't too much housing. Right. And in fact, we'll get into the details later, I'm sure. But but even in cities like Phoenix at that time, there there weren't too many houses uh, when you really look at the details of what's happening. And five or six years later, uh, Bernanke is still saying, you know, well, the 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 uh, economic recovery is still moving a little slow because we're still just working off this overhang of supply. Uh, and so this sort of the mythology that we had too many houses uh, sort of muddied our public policy decisions. It really has been for a decade. Uh, you know, we really had a shortage of housing. We've been managing the economy as if we had a surplus. And you can imagine how just that mistake itself, uh, when you follow it through one policy decision after another, could itself lead to a crisis situation, right? This is a huge asset class that we're treating in an right. upside down sort of bizarro. For most effort. people, it is the main asset class in yes. America, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for better or for worse, housing mm-hmm. does make up most of our asset side of household balance sheets. Yeah. And you, uh, just to follow up on that, so in terms of data, you know, like just one of the basic things that I've looked at is say just housing units, you know, these are, these are basic. This is not buried in the bowels of the, of the BEA or the BLS or something. Just go to the Census Bureau and look at uh, housing units per adult or housing units p- per capita. Uh, there was a rise in those measures through say the seventies and eighties as household reorganization was sort of happening culturally. But those have been fairly level measures. Yeah. You know, from. So that's what I want to get into with you now is, is, is the, the metrics that you present. Mm-hmm. And you, your book has a lot of them. So we'll touch on just a few, but you're, that, that's your kind of your, your argument is that there was actually a shortage of housing 
that led to a number of bad policy decisions, misunderstanding that ultimately led us to a great recession. And, and, and even since then, the, the response that's been given has been inadequate. But let's, let's kind of build your argument up for our listeners. And let's begin with the one you just touched on. And, you know, this is your, uh, kind of contesting the claim there was a supply overhang. And so you go through a number of measures that, that do this. So let's work through them. Mm-hmm. Um, let's start with housing units per capita or a number of homes, I guess, or housing stock per person. You mentioned, just just mentioned actually that it had, it had been going up in the 80s pretty sharply, right? Yes. And, yes, the, yes. and the early to mid-2000s really wasn't exceptional. No, there's there's a little bit of a a little bit of a rise, mm-hmm. um, but there had been quite a bit of a decline during the you know housing starts compared to historical standards were pretty tame through the '90s, and so there had actually been sort of a slow decline. So we sort of made up some of that ground, um, and uh, and part I think partly what what led people off the track there is that we tended to concentrate. It seemed like the bubbles in single family housing. And that was a, a lot of the focus, right? Uh, and so the idea was that there was this, there was this, uh, uh, excess of, of lending into that market. And so whenever you'd see charts and graphs or whatever, it would be single family homes built for sale. And that, you know, may, it was, you know, probably more than 50% growth over a few years in that category. And it looks, like, you know, right. prices are rising right. at the same time. That looks crazy. It looks like that's all these measures. They, they looked at first glance as if it was, how could it be anything but a demand bubble? You've got quantity and price going at the same time. The same time. Yep. But uh, over that entire period, you know, there's, there's manufactured homes, there's multi unit housing, there's homes built by owners or homes built by contractors for individuals. There's a lot of kind of, there's five or six major conduits of new housing units. Most of that growth in single family homes was just market share shift from those other units. So when you add up all those other units and especially manufactured homes, which don't, you know, you have to sort of grab. What is a manufactured home? So, you know, these are sort of, they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, you could have anything from say a park model or something that was, that, that's, uh, uh, more like in uh, recreational, you know, building off the recreational vehicle category toward like more just like factory constructed homes that are then prefabricated okay. and brought to the site and made into a permanent okay. uh, location. You know, so there's a couple different categories there and they're sort of tracked separately in a, you know, by the Census Bureau. Uh, okay. So you have to sort of to, to really get the total number of units, you have to sort of grab these two these different. Yeah. yeah. And when you add them all together, um, you know, there's nothing, there's really nothing during that boom period in 2002 to 2005. We're slightly over the long term average. In fact, you could even, if you measure it, say, at a per capita basis or something, we didn't really ever. Yeah. So on a per capita basis, it's very clear that there's at, at most like a little bump. In fact, the way I would describe it, looking at your figures, housing stock per capita per person. There's a little bump on a road that's going downhill. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so there's, <laughs> yeah, there's actually yeah. a, the, Recent few decades has been a decline relative to the 80s. Yeah. But then what you're, I think the second point you're making here is if, even if you just look at the absolute number of housing starts, mm-hmm. if you don't divide by population, what the, the mistake was, and I'm guilty of this too, is that we looked at housing starts for single family homes. Mm-hmm. And even, you know, you're watching CNBC, watching some news channel, the picture they throw up is a, a individual home, yeah. the kind of home that yeah. I live in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they put that up. And you identify, you don't think of like condos, apartments, you don't, you know, you're not thinking of multifamily and these other, but so your, your point is if you add up all the housing and I, I wouldn't have looked on Fred, they didn't, you know, you're absolutely right that mm-hmm. your charts show this too, that it really, it really wasn't that unusual, mm-hmm. which is kind of, you know, like mind blown moment, you know, yeah, I had to do <laughs> yeah. a, a, a retake on this. I'm like, oh, did Kevin get these numbers right? Now, mm-hmm. now, one question I had about your housing units per capita was the 1980s. It's, it's a pretty st- stark mm-hmm. change in the trajectory. There's, there's a huge yeah. increase in the 80s in the number of homes per person built. Mm-hmm. And one question I had, I, I was wondering if maybe that's tied to the baby boom or, or are we past that period? Uh, well, I don't think it's so much the baby. But I think that that shift in the 80s probably had more to do with uh, falling household size, uh, oh, okay. uh, sort of that, that 
I mean, it had to do with the baby boomer lifestyle change, right? The divorce rates rose, right, for that period of time. There was sort of oh, more okay. um, sing, maybe single household, head of household households, that sort of thing. So the number of, of adults per household has been declining, and it was probably a pretty strong factor okay, at that point. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. The ba- actually, more thing about the baby boomers would have been several decades before, probably in the '60s and '70s, when they bought their first homes. Uh, well, they were pro- they were probably they were probably in the market as first time buyers at that Some time. Of them, okay, um, but you know that's that's why I I kind of like the households per adult measure better for that okay. reason because it sort of factors in that. But that just the the number of adults data is a little messier than the per cat than the population data. And so I like to use both to sort of show the That's right. You did show both in the yeah. graph. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have these measures that show there wasn't a boom in the quantity relative to population and even in the absolute number. You also show the amount of expenditures in housing or on housing adjusted for inflation. And that similarly does not show some kind of alarming growth, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things, you know, it's, it's funny when you sort of look at all the, this topic from a new framework and you read the, the other analysis on, on the housing market, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of, um, misplaced sort of gravitas overlaid uh, on, on the analysis. You know, there's a lot of, for some reason, housing is treated as this sort of like nasty form of overconsumption. You know, so one of the things that I've looked at, you know, we really have there's sort of the education, healthcare, housing, you know, trifecta. That's like the three sort of sectors eating the economy. Right. Right. And the funny thing is housing is very uh, um, sensitive to income, like over decades in nominal terms, households of in in terms of rental value, households have spent you know, in terms of GDP, I think it's maybe like around 12% or something of GDP. If you, know, if you look at income data, it's, it's a maybe more like 18%, but it's, it's since the say late seventies to today, that portion of spending is, is flat in rental terms, right? Um, but education and healthcare have, you know, shot up, you know, they're taking more and more of our incomes every year, right? Uh, but for some reason, uh, when people think about housing, they think about keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, your people are buying houses that are more than what they need. And it, and we have and this sort mansions. Of, yeah. Yeah. We have this like judgmental like idea about it. But actually for the last 30 years, uh, Americans in the aggregate have been ratcheting down their real housing consumption because, because the rent, the rent inflation has been high. Right. So out of those three categories, it's actually the one category that's sort of tethered to, you know, that we're naturally uh, mm-hmm. unwinding our real consumption uh, as a sort of compensation for these other costs. So, yeah. So o- over that period of time, you know, since the mid eighties, real, it, it, if you compare consumption, real consumption of housing in terms of rental value, which uh, to sort of back up a little bit, I think that's one of the really important sort of foundations of looking at all this coherently is to not confuse price and rent. I think rent, we need to, we need to reorient ourselves in this sort of analysis toward rent as being the cost of the service of housing, the thing that we build everything else on. And Price is more like the price of a bond. It's more like, you know, the, the decision of, of allocating capital in a certain way. You know, a lot of the 30 or 40% of the, of the households in the country are renters. The, the, the price of their unit is in, insignificant to them. So, um, so in this BEA data, we're really, we're looking at it as in terms of the rental value of the housing stock. And since the eighties, every year, uh, households, uh, you know, the, their real incomes go up two or three percent. But their real consumption of housing only goes up one or two percent. And, but then they have an extra percent of rent inflation every year because that's focused in these cities. It's focused in New York City and Boston and San Francisco and LA. Um, and so yeah, in real terms, we've been cutting back on housing. We haven't been keeping up with the Joneses at all. In fact, what we're trying to do, what Americans are trying to do in the aggregate is keep up with the Joneses incomes. And the way to keep up with the Joneses incomes is to bid your way into LA or San Francisco and, okay. and all that income goes to the landlord. Yeah. So, you know, to answer your question, why do we think we're keeping up with the Joneses? I mean, part of it is because there is this perception, a wrong perception, which is what you're trying to argue. Yeah. The housing is, you know, the, the, these bubbles have occurred. And, and again, your point is, is more of a supply side constraint. Uh, 
Yeah. And that housing really, I mean, what, the last point you just made, housing to the extent it matters is really a symptom of the deeper underlying problem. This is, you know, the desire to move to a city to get the income. Yeah. But these cities have problems. And that is a nice transition to the next part of, of your work. And that is the closed access problem. So you mentioned New York City, Los Angeles, Boston, and San Francisco is the key cities that have this problem. You call them closed access cities. So tell us about that. What what makes them a closed access city? Yeah, so they have you could you know, if you're if you're casting a wider net, you could throw San Diego in there probably, but it's, you know, a little bit, so, you know, these these four cities are really uh, you know, 99, 95% of, of the issue okay. in terms of aggregate total value or aggregate. Um, eventually, if you cast the net wide enough, I think Honolulu sort of falls in the cat, has some of the okay. same signatures, mm-hmm. but every, every other city in the country, even, you know, Seattle and Washington managed to build more than the average number of housing units in their metro areas. And, and so they don't have these signatures. Um, so the thing that makes those cities different is, you know, across the board, they have much lower rates of housing starts. Uh, than the average city. Um, and, and, you know, really what's happened is if you think of the drag this puts on an economy, the natural historical sort of uh, um, moderating feature of a free economy is, is that mi- migration of jobs and labor, right, to sort of moderate differences between uh, regional areas. And that was happening for decades. And, and in a lot of ways, it's still happening uh, in other parts of the country and other parts of the economy. But because these uh, four cities have have you know cut off, they have basically a cap on their populations. In effect, um, they've actually reversed that flow. So now we actually have the, a, a strong migration pattern of households with lower incomes who are in need of opportunity having to move out of those cities, and households with higher incomes moving into those cities. So what's What's been, you know, a centuries long process of moderation has now turned into a process of inequality, of separation, of segregation, right? By skill and income. Uh, and so in these cities, you get this very distinct signature where their income, average incomes are very high and growing. Uh, housing starts are very low and then, and then rents, rent inflation every year, you know, just keeps ratcheting up and ratcheting up. So a, a good portion of those high incomes is simply just routed through wages to the real estate ownership class. So it's a way of uh, protecting <laughs> the people who first were there who owned the real estate. It's kind of a rent seeking. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it sort of happens by accident. I think people, you know, every, every neighborhood uh, right. has always sort of not wanted to change. I mean, that's, right? that's true for me, right? I, I mean, yeah. all, I think all of us kind of naturally want to keep our neighborhood looking nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's easy to be critical of the nimbyism, not in my backyard mentality. I think all of us would be guilty. It's rash, it's rational as an individual, just yeah. as a society collectively, it's, it's harmful. Yeah. Yeah. So, and but, I think that's where, you know, that, that, that's the political dilemma is how to sort of solve that, uh, you know, community, uh, right. act, you know, problem. Uh, and, and, and so I think it has to be solved. And one of the things I go into in the book is, is sort of the, the North Wallace and Weingast idea of limited access orders versus open access orders. And I think that's the real, in terms of this part of the problem, that's the real dilemma is even they, you know, they, they sort of lay out how universal access and, and free flow of labor and capital and, and all these things are important to an open society with a, abundance and economic growth. And, and even they sort of say, you know, we know how, we know what it looks like. We don't know how to make it. And, and in a way, these cities have devolved back into a limited access order. Uh, and so the local politics are all about getting your part, part of the, of those rents, extracting your part of the rents. And that can be by starting having a monopoly on real estate ownership that can be through rent control so that you get to live in the 4,000 a month uh, unit for only a thousand dollars a month. Right. And so uh, in that context, everyone feels like they have a, the moral authority to get their part of the, of the fixed pie. Right. Uh, and somehow collectively, we all have to pull back from that and, and allow it to be open again, which means everybody sort of makes compromises for the sake of an open society. But how, how to do that is a tough nut to crack. Yeah. And what's interesting is that the problems in these cities are spilling over into other cities. So you have that same nimbyism. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. 
But I, I want to mention, I mean, the point you're, you're raising here is these cities represent kind of the, the hub of innovation, creative mm-hmm. growth, the Enrique Moretti, you know, story about there's so much growth. In fact, he, he argued and his co-authors that if you could get full access, GDP would raise, would go up by a significant amount. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I yeah. mean, quite a large amount. And the fact that we haven't been able to allow people to move there has really restricted the amount of growth we would otherwise have experienced in the U.S. economy. And it might be part of the decline in economic dynamism. All right. So we have these closed access cities. And you said you could, you kind of, you could nudge, you know, the definitions, the margins, but for sure we know New York City, Los Angeles, Boston, San Francisco are in the group, maybe a few other cities. Well, well, I I mean, it really is a significant, uh, a significant category. Like there's not a lot of gray area. Like uh, Seattle and Washington have sort of a a bit of a high cost problem. They have some, some rent inflation. Uh, but at least so far, you know, it'll, we'll have to see how Seattle deals with it because really they're, they're sort of dealing with the same pressures. Um, but so far they've, Seattle, for instance, has, uh, has built more units, uh, than the national average generally over time. And they don't have that migration, but you don't see low income households flooding out of Seattle to other cities like you see out of, uh, uh out of the California cities. What I think what happens is that, they maybe aren't capable of building enough new units to keep rent inflation from being above general inflation, but they're able to build enough so that those households on the margin maybe have to move to a less uh, convenient location or maybe a smaller unit, but they can remain in the in the labor market, the Seattle labor market. They don't have to actually leave their entire okay. life there behind. Uh, and so there's a real distinct difference you can All see right, in those, so those four cities. Those four cities are, are unique, and then. I don't think you use this term, but you know the opposite would be an open access city, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, 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 the open access city, and and they're they're very different. I mean, open access city, you have high housing starts or homes are being built, rents is, rents and prices are moderate, so it's more elastic housing supply versus the, yeah. the closed access city. You got you know very few housing starts and rents and prices are high and inelastic housing supply. Yeah. So. Yeah. The the confusion arises, if I understand you correctly, is that we aggregate all these cities together and we, we look at like a, a national measure. We see some housing s- starts going up. We see, on average, prices going up, but it's conflating these, these two different types of cities, right? So yeah, yeah. the housing boom, the Schiller index, indexes, all those things are really kind of masking the, these very strong difference that underneath – um, the aggregate indicator. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I think that's sort of one of the things I did differently, uh, that sort of led to this new viewpoint is, is if you look individually, if you treat each metropolitan area as sort of a, an individual economic zone that's going to have substitutions within that housing market. And so you sort of treat it as an entity. And, and if you, if you take all, you know, say the top, 50 metro areas and you know there's these outlet these closed access cities were outliers in terms of the price change but if you look at rent they're actually what happened is they were outliers in terms of rent so at the national level it looked like price to rent ratios were out of you know way out of whack and that and that was the uh you know that was a sign that that prices had become unmoored from rents and that so that looks like it was another piece of evidence that fed this credit supply view uh, the credit was behind rising prices, right? And so it would naturally have to retract. But if you, if you actually look at individual, the difference between metropolitan areas, rent really explains everything. You know, they're, they're, they're outliers first in terms of rent and then where prices are high is where rents are high. And I think there was a, a little bit of a regime shift, you know, up till the mid nineties, uh, a city that had, say, a temporary rise in rents, might you know you'd have mean reversion over time there was no there was no um you know sort of uh 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 there weren't there weren't these outliers that developed right so so before the say the mid 90s uh, if if a city sort of became an outlier in terms of rent it would eventually move back toward the norm and prices at that time didn't reflect an expectation of future rising rents but as we've entered this this period of the immovable force and the unstop or immovable object and unstoppable force where these cities there's demand for urbanization and these cities won't accommodate it um 
part of what led to the to the a little bit of that extra price rise in that 95 to 2005 era is now suddenly a, a San Francisco where rents for that rent inflation for that period is above normal nobody's expecting that to revert to the mean right so now the price of a house in San Francisco not only reflects the rent inflation that's happened for a decade but now it's almost like buying a growth stock versus a value stock. Now, now that house is actually a rent hedge for the rent inflation that everybody knows is going to happen for the next decade. And so it created the, a little bit of an extra price boost in those cities. And so that's what moves the national price to rent ratio above a norm okay. because there's these few locations where, where you have this more than one to one reaction. Right. Also, is part of your story, though, the, the, the contagion cities? So you, your contagion cities are the cities you mentioned where people move from New York City, from San Francisco, because they're looking for cheaper housing. But yeah. when they get to these cities, these cities are having a hard time keeping up with the influx of folks. So their prices also go up. There's also yeah. – yeah. so, so, so when we look at the national indicators, you know, we see housing prices take off the, the boom in the early to mid-2000s. It's because of the closed access cities, but is it also partly the, re- the the result of the contagion cities? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's one of the things that I that I end up doing. So, talking about these migration patterns and these housing mm-hmm. start patterns, um, you can you really need. Everybody is sort of lumped together the quote unquote bubble cities that includes the Florida cities in Arizona and Nevada and inland California. And sort of lumped those together with the closed access cities and, and it was just a bubble story. But the, in a lot of ways, these are mirror images to one another. And the, the closed access cities in terms of just total size are much larger than the, you know, the, the LA and San Francisco and New York City are much larger than Phoenix plus, uh, plus Las Vegas plus Riverside plus Tampa or Miami. Um, and so, so firstly, just the closed access issue is, is just, in terms of absolute numbers is By the itself, largest part of the story. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, and it, so in those, so what I call the contagion cities, they're the mirror image because, because when you had these massive outflows of migration during the housing bubble from the closed access cities, what makes Florida and Arizona and Nevada and inland California different from the rest of the country isn't that they had a different credit market really. What makes them different is that they're the, they're catching the first wave of that out migration. They're the main net receivers of net migration out of the Atlantic Northeast and out of the uh, Pacific Coast. Um, so they were overwhelmed. For them, it was a migration event, a refugee crisis, really, in a way. And so they were overwhelmed mm-hmm. with new households that needed houses, right? So as part of that process, you know, uh, say you have an oil boom that's happening, right? It's sort of the similar sort of story. It, when oil prices jump to $120 a barrel, whatever, there's always this sort of part of the story that, oh, it's the speculators driving up prices, right? People tend to want to blame speculation and, right? Um, and so it's sort of the same thing happened in housing. Like, these other factors were actually creating this this boom in those cities. And when that sort of boom happens, you're going to get a lot of activity. You're going to get a lot of people transitioning in and out of that market because the context has changed. You're going to get people speculating, you know, people that, that started out as a small time investor and had a quick 40 percent return on investment. And they're re, you know, re upping into that market. So you're going to have a lot of speculative ac- activity that goes along with that. But that doesn't doesn't do anything to tell you what the cause was. Right. That's always going to be there in any market where prices are rising. But when you look at the actual numbers of what was happening, so you're, you're in a city like Phoenix over the course of five or six years, their housing permits uh, went up probably 50 percent. Uh, at the same time, their prices went up like something like 75 percent. And again, it's this other this another thing where any reasonable person looking at that pair of indicators can say that's a demand issue i can i know that now now i can now i can look at other things and and know that that this is a demand cause problem is sort of uh part of the canon now like it's i i don't have to question it it's like gravity i if if other evidence comes to me that that contradicts that i can disregard it because this is i've decided that now right but if you if you notice these migration flows you know over that time maybe it's 20, 25,000 extra units a year that were being built in Phoenix. There were 20 or 25,000 extra households moving from coastal California into Phoenix at the time. They were barely keeping up with the, with the demand. 
And, and the irony is, you know, if you're in Phoenix, that looks like, it looks like speculation. It looks like you're, I, you know, I live in Phoenix. It, it look, it, we were laughing about the price of housing at the time. Um, and it probably, you know, there probably were some unsustainable, you know, you could truly call those cities bubbles, uh, in a way, because there was probably some snapback that was going to happen. Um, but it wasn't a bubble at its core caused by, by credit. It was a bubble caused by this mass migration event. And, and the irony is the, on the margin, those households moving in from LA were moving to Phoenix explicitly and, you know, clearly to reduce their housing consumption. So one of the, you know, I basically, you know, say even by 2005, when this ma- migration events happening in Phoenix looks like it's a bubble and everyone is convinced that this is a speculative excess, it's actually a bubble. And again, I say this as a proud resident of Phoenix. It's a bubble for those marginal buyers. It's a bubble in an inferior good. Right. It's people. It, it's similar to if second we, best. Yeah. Solution. Yeah. So yes. it's like if you if we were a, a subsistence, subsistence society and right and there was a drought and the price of rice went up and everybody's consolidating into rice consumption. Right. It's that like that's not something that you tamp down. That's something you stimulate your way out of. Right. Mm-hmm. And and. So, you know, the, you think of that, the family living in LA that, you know, that they're, they're moving out of a little thousand square foot condo that's renting for $3,000 uh, a month. They might be moving into a 3,000 square foot house in Phoenix that's only $1,500 a month, right? So even though, it, again, it's like another sort of thing that leads us off the path, it looks like there's a lot of gypsum board and lumber and all sorts of things going to Phoenix. Residential investment's actually increasing as a product of this migration. So again, res- now residential investment uh, confirms the excess story. But that family that just built that 3,000 square foot house in Phoenix – was actually making a tremendous down sh- downshift in their real housing consumption. Okay, so the story again is it, it starts in the closed access cities where there's supply restrictions. There's a boom. There, there, there's a, a sudden rise in prices during this period because they can't uh, meet the demand for housing. That drives up the aggregate picture. But on top of that, there's spillover into contagion cities, Mm -hmm. which also can't meet this demand. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like the way you frame it. It, There's the the refugees, housing refugees, Mm -hmm. you know, this image of, you know, we can't find any homes. Please help us. And, and, you know, and so California, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, they they open arms. And you have a nice graph in your paper that shows migration flows for the Closed access cities and the contagion cities, and they're almost, it's like a mirror image of, of each other, right? They're, yep. Yep. It's, it's a very striking graph. So it's a very convincing story. Um, let me, let me ask this question though. In the closed access cities, you know, you, there is this kind of a, a surge in prices during the early to mid 2000s. So I was looking at the Schiller case index and there's kind of like a little bit of, a bit of a surge. It's, it's growing the whole time, mm-hmm. but is that surge atypical? I mean, is there a reason why it goes up as much as it mm-hmm. does during the early to mid 2000s in the, you know, in those key cities? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there, there is a credit aspect to the story here. Um, and, you know, and so you can see, as, especially like before the Fed starts raising rates in 2004, there's a brief period of time there where there was the, su- the subprime boom was happening and the Alte boom was happening sort of starting at the end of 2003. And, and that was especially happening in the California city. So during that period, you can see a bit of a separation between the Boston, New York City type of market and okay. the L.A., San Francisco market. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to that private securitization market, which was very heavy in California. Um, and, and so you, so I think there's a credit portion of the story there, but, but I think the consensus or sort of the, the general view of the public on this has been that there, the, any, the quote, anyone with a pulse could get a mortgage, right? That's the, like the line okay. you hear all the time. And really what was happening was a little bit more subtle. Uh, you know, these are markets where if you're a renter, you're outside the norm, right? The the risk in those housing markets is inherent in the closed access problem. If you move to LA or San Francisco, you're taking on housing risk uh, 
full stop, period. It doesn't matter what you do to supply housing for yourself. You are in a high risk environment. Yeah. So, you know, we don't have agencies in Washington uh, writing rules that you can't spend more than 50 percent of your income on rent. Right. But we do have agencies that say you can't lend to somebody that's, you know, that's. Uh, spending more than 40 or 50 percent on on mortgage. Right. So actually there was I would say there was a, a, a dislocation in the market before the private securitization market. happened. Okay. It was actually keeping prices below um, the you know, what would be a, a norm, a, a reasonable level in those cities because of those because we regulate one and don't regulate the other. And in the data, what you really see happening in those cities is, you know, there it's implausible that that. Households with low incomes that couldn't afford a mortgage could have had any significant effect on those markets. The, the very small portion of, of the L.A. and San Francisco market is owned by people with, say, median and below incomes. And, right. for, and to the extent that they own homes, they bought them 20 years ago and they're sitting on, you know, capital gains and – and so what you actually see happening is those sorts of the alt A loans were actually allowing high income households to, to, make a rational decision for themselves between, you know, they were basically buying those houses as a rent hedge. Now they were probably spending 50% of their income on, on the mortgage payment. So, so documenting their income is, is not useful. You know, trying to get them into a loan with Fannie and Freddie is not useful. They're not going to meet conventional norms. So the irony is it was actually the most um, qualified borrowers that were feeding that closed access part of the story. And then the, you know, the out migration into those yeah. other cities is a little more messy. It's a combination of sort of tactical sellers and desperate renters looking to lower their expenses. So that's a little messier situation. But at the core, it's, it's credit to qualified borrowers. And you can see this like in the survey for, uh, of, um, uh, the Federal Reserve Survey of, of Consumer Finances, uh, toward the, you know, in that 2004 to 2007 period, there was a boost in, what you would call, say, distressed mortgages, mortgages that require more than 40% of your income. The entire growth of that problem was in the top two income quintiles. Huh. And it's because that was the story. It was those households bidding act, bidding their way into those cities. Into the better where, markets. Yeah. 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 So the, the key story again is in these closed access cities, there's increased desire to live there because that's where the income growth is. That's where the, you know, the Enrique Moretti story is being told, the, the creative class. And, the, and so it's, it's a supply constraint. People want to move there, but there aren't enough housing. Now, I guess my question would be, does this desire to move there really come to a head during this period? I mean, you know, is this, you know, the internet is, the advent of the internet's really come to fruition after the, the tech boom, all that overinvestment in, in internet technology, communication technology. So maybe there is this sudden spike in real demand for that kind of living. And so the credit story is just kind of a maybe icing on the cake in those cities. Yeah. 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 Sort of along for the ride. And, you know, I think there were some aspects of that private securitization market, uh, that, you know, probably, like I said, probably boosted things in LA and, San Francisco a little bit, but you know, uh, the, the Fannie and Freddie take a lot of heat for this period, but they were highly counter cyclical. They were, they lost a lot of market share during that 2004 and 2005 period. So there were, there was a lot, there were a lot of things happening, pushing prices higher and also pushing against prices. In fact, you know, this migration issue, uh, is, is, is one of the parts of that story. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that there's been a lot of focus on is sort of the housing ATM, right? The, this idea that. Pull an equity out of the house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there's this idea that there's this bubble sort of process that prices rise and that encourages households to overspend and buy more and leverage up. Uh, and so of course there was, there was some, uh, you know, there were some households that were, um, utilizing their newfound home equity for spending. That was, some of that was definitely going on. Although I, even in that, uh, on that topic, I would say the reframing makes a big difference on how you look at it. Cause if you look at it as this unsustainable credit bubble that's destined to collapse, then that just looks like people consuming out of something that's fake, that's paper profits, right? Right. But if those houses are expensive because there's this persistent problem of supply that's, that, that will continue. And, and, you know, as of today, a decade later, the relative prices of houses in those cities is just as much above the rest of the country as it was then. So it's certainly a persistent, 
value in relative terms. So housing's a good investment in these cities still. Well, I, I won't, <laughs> you won't go there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's a political risk you're taking on, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but, but my point is switching our frame, just switching our mental framing of what happened, that this is a persistent issue and not a credit uh, cycle event. Even those, say, low-income households that happen to be homeowners that were using this uh, event to – to spend out of home equity, effectively, they're, they're rentiers, right? They're, they, they have newfound wealth that's permanent. And especially the ones that sold their house and moved to Phoenix, that, that's permanent, right? Right. Um, they're, that, they're engaging in, in just natural consumption smoothing. They have newfound wealth. They'd like to spend some of it today as opposed to in the future because they're wealthier now as a result of it. There's nothing unsustainable about that, right? And actually for those new households, you know, for the ones that sold and new households moved in and have these huge mortgage payments for them, that's not stimulative for them. They have these huge mortgage payments they have to make. And the people that sold that home to them and moved to Phoenix or Denver or whatever, they stuck all that money into AAA security or whatever, right? They saved it, right? So I think one of the aspects that sort of the focus was on all the demand side stuff, the focus was on the housing ATM, the bar unsustainable borrowing. One of the things we missed, you know, coming out of this migration pattern is in 2004 and five, a lot of that migration was tactical, was, was homeowners sitting in their house in 2004 and five, you know, Jesus thinks going for a million and a half. That's, that's crazy. They, they may have even thought of it as a bubble. But it doesn't really matter what they thought of it. They saw their house. They saw home equity as an unsafe asset class now, right? And so they're transitioning their portfolio really in a way out of that asset class. And so during that period, there's about 2% a year in the closed access cities of net out migration of homeowners. That's a lot of selling pressure, right? So we, everyone's focused on all these ways that a bubble feeds on itself. And, and since price is higher, but. But, you know, every year, maybe, I don't know, five or six percent of the housing stock may transact. Well, in those cities, there was a two percent selling pressure of people hiking out of town, taking their gains and getting out of town. That's a huge amount of actually mitigating downward pressure on prices. Let me ask this question, then. How does this come to a head when the so-called bubble bursts, when things slow down? So, for example, in the contagion cities, you you talk about. Phoenix in your paper quite a bit. You kind of zero in on it as a case study of sorts. Mm -hmm. Why does the migration to Phoenix, you know, slow down? If that's what's driving prices or what causes the slowdown, was it the Fed raising interest rates? Mm -hmm. What was the shock that suddenly now people aren't wanting to move to Phoenix and the housing prices drop? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the conventional story is that Phoenix overbuilt. There were way too many houses. Uh, they were all, uh, bought by people that had no business, uh, you know, couldn't afford their mortgage. And so they all de started to default. Then prices, you know, then those neighborhoods sort of were undermined and prices collapsed. Um, and the story really, the data tells the opposite story. Um, so housing starts really, one thing is that it, across the country in every city, housing starts pretty much start to collapse at about the same time around early 2006, which is about when the Federal Reserve, you know, was reaching the, the highest uh, rate level and the, the yield curve was inverting. Um, and so, so whether it's Phoenix or Omaha or Los Angeles, uh, housing starts were already collapsing then. Um, and prices stayed pretty level for, you know, 18 months or so up till sort of mid to late 2007, just about in every city. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, in a, so in a city like Phoenix, what you see is housing, uh, housing starts start to collapse. The other thing that happens is again, basically in, in just about every city in the country in two, way back in 2006, as soon as housing starts start to collapse, rent inflation across the country shoots up. Right now, if we had an overabundance uh, abundance of housing and this was a natural uh, process, that's a strange thing to see happen. Right. And it's a strange thing to see happen in every city at the same time. But that's what we see. And so even in Phoenix, where we thought there was an oversupply, rent inflation shoots up, housing starts start to decline. And uh, what you see is is. And the, well, in the period backing up before that, that 2004 and five period, really, like I said, was, was these households basically seeing rate hikes coming, uh, thinking of home equity as something unsafe. They're moving to Phoenix to get out of home equity. Um, 
eventually as that process unwinds and sentiment starts turning sour, now people start retracting and like late. So now that migration pattern start, uh, starts to wind down even among renters. So I think even by like 2006, by the end of 2006, especially what you have are, are people that were migrating to lower costs. Now are saying, you know, I'm getting a little okay. nervous about the economy. Uh, we're going to stay in L.A. We're going to put up with the rising rents because we're starting to feel nervous about the economy. So and the it, migration wave came to an end. Yeah. So that, that was driving. Yeah. The, okay. So what? So by the end of 2007, what Phoenix lacks isn't tenants. Rent inflation is going high. And tenancy vacancies were low in Phoenix until 2008. So there's there's no sign in the vacancy. In fact, the funny thing is. Uh, in most cities, there's never a sign of a vacancy issue uh, in the housing stock. Uh, in the few cities that have it, it's the contagion cities that had this mass migration of it that suddenly dried up over a period of a couple years. And it's only after the migration dries up that you see sort of the entire – that entire sort of local economy fall apart and then vacancy rates are a lagging okay. issue. So – the initial slowdown, because you, you know my narrative is in 2008, the Fed really made a mistake. But yeah. the story begins before then, because we know housing slows down beginning in 2006. And your story is that this migration wave came to a stop. And it came to a stop, you said, because people's expectations were changing about yeah. what was going to happen to the prices. Yeah. My, my question is, was that change in expectations driven by Fed policy or by something else? I think what, you know, I think there's a bit of an avalanche effect here, right? Okay. So, so, you know, by the time we get to late 2008, everything's big, right? Everything's a, uh, you know, a, a crisis and, and uh, fluctuations everywhere. The stuff that led to that, it starts small, right? So, you know, so, so you start in spring of 2006 and the Federal Reserve is saying, oh, good, we've we've caused residential investment to decline when we actually have a shortage of housing. That's that's a that's a big mistake. But we're still sort of within the boundaries of like fixable errors. Right. And so we sort of move along with that idea for a while. And then and then the the, the Federal Reserve trying to to sort of comfort everybody starts saying, well, you know, you don't have to worry, everybody. Um We've we've sort of run the numbers and we've decided even if housing, even if home prices declined by 10 or 20 percent, the economy is going to be fine. So don't worry about the housing bust. This is just a natural, you know, they use the word even in their press releases, they use the word correction, which I harp on a lot in the in the follow up book. I harp on a lot like that root word correct, like we, this was actually a dislocation and and the way we were officially describing it was correct right so so the upside down sort of nature of our of our policy responses is just clear in that verbiage um but think about the effect that has so t thinking about that household in, around the dinner table in LA that's that think that says okay we're selling at the top of the bubble and we're moving to a less expensive city you know in financial terms what they, they're having a conversation about you know we have we have a a large portion of our portfolio and what we thought was a safe asset class, which is home equity. And we don't consider that a safe asset class anymore. We're fleeing away from the home equity asset class because we don't trust it anymore. And now the Fed, uh, thinking that they're being, uh, you know, that they're making us feel more comfortable says, yeah, your asset, that asset class could lose 20% of its value and we're not going to do a thing about it. We're, you know, we, we think that's correct. That's a correction that only feeds the the sense that the ha home equity asset class is unsafe, and I think this goes to a topic you talk a lot about of uh, the safe asset shortage, right? I think actually the first step of the safe asset shortage was this change in sentiment that sort of happened okay. as rates were rising, that that suddenly this huge multi trillion dollar asset class goes from being a safe asset to not being a safe asset. That actually ends up feeding this frenzy for for AAA okay, securities so in the CDO market, and so at first it's sort of just a little tweak, a little bit too far in just basic monetary uh, management. But then there's this sort of sentiment side of it because everyone just assumed that prices were out of whack, and so as housing starts were were falling to to levels that are very recessionary in any other context. We thought, well, yeah, we had too many houses. It's going to take a while for that to catch up. And in the meantime, we're sort of waiting, like, you know, eventually prices are going to have to follow too. Well, the fact that for 18 months that collapse was happening and prices were pretty stable actually to me is sort of a confirmation 
that prices didn't need to fall. And the fact that everyone sort of was waiting for that to happen before we could accommodate, you know, the, 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 the general public conversation or even conversations at the Fed at the time were, you know, we should probably should lower rates, but that's just gonna, you know, these speculators need to learn their lesson. They need to know that house prices go down sometimes, right? So, so the original air was that the Fed raised rates too much early on. Mm-hmm. Which began to ins- raise questions in these homeowners' minds. Yeah. And it, it, cr- it kind of created a snowball effect. And then by the time you get to 2008, which is a story that I usually tell and Scott Summer would tell was yeah. the Fed, you know, a- greatly amplified matters, made them worse. But yeah. So you, you would put the original sin back in 2006. I would. So yeah, I, I okay. would say, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud, but you know, market, the market monitor's no, view yeah. is sort of that the Fed caused the recession and it didn't have anything to do with the housing bust. I, I would say the Fed caused the housing bust, right? And then, then fed into a yeah, broader crisis. Yeah. So, but you know, even by late 2007, that was all, it was all very, you know, I think, you know, had they sort of kept rates a little lower in 2006, we would have never had, maybe even never even had a recession. And we would all be sitting here having a conversation today about whose fault it is that home prices are still so high. And and yeah. we would have taken for granted that we had never, you know, that we'd had nice, good right. uh, economic growth for the last 10 years. And we'd be looking about who to blame for We're housing a very prices. different world. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, even by late 2007, that's all fixable. Uh, but it took, it would have taken a total, they, the Fed would have had to, would have been pilloried for it, right? The, the entire public would have been upset at them for letting speculators off the right. hook. Bailing out housing and, yeah. and people yeah. made bad decisions. And so it's sort of a model risk thing. If your model's wrong, right? Uh, when the bust happens, you will, you know, you take that as confirmation. You know, if your bubble says we have to have a contraction, that that's necessary, then then when the contraction happens, you take that as confirmation. But the contraction was actually a result of model risk. We had the model wrong. <laughs> yeah, so in the time we have left, just a couple of observations and a final question. My observation is your story, which seems fairly compelling, and you present lots of data to support it and encourage our listeners to get the book. But the observation I want to make is that this story of financial imbalances, of excesses, was simply wrong. I mean, we talked earlier about that this really undermines the Austrian business cycle interpretation of, of the early to mid-2000. The mal- there's a bunch of yeah. malinvestment that occurred. Yeah. Yeah. And this would say, no, 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 that's completely wrong. But also just not even Austrian, but just kind of this general narrative that these excesses, financial imbalances – and what your what your analysis shows is that that's completely wrong. That this is really a supply side story, a, a misreading of the data. And I think, you know, in addition to what you show over that period, seems to me, and this is where my question comes in, that what we're talking about today is kind of confirmation of what you are saying happened back then. The fact that people on the left and the right are talking about zoning restrictions, NIMBYism. The lack of labor dynamism, the decline in labor mobility to these big, high-income earning cities mm-hmm. is really just a continuation of this trend that you say actually was going on back then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things I um, uh, that I find in the data, for instance, is in inflation data. Uh, at the peak of the what we called the bubble in late 2005, so, you know, for the last 20-plus years, rent inflation has been – consistently above core inflation. So most, you know, a good part, maybe close to half of what's been measured core inflation has been from shelter inflation. Um, and it was only toward the end of 2005 that, that shelter inflation and, and the non-shelter part of core inflation both sort of converged at 2%. So at the top of what we were calling a bubble was actually the, the only period of time in the last 20 years that we actually achieved a sort of normalcy, uh, in this second best world where you can't build the houses that you'd like to have in, in the coastal, the coastal metropolises, our second best alternative, if we're going to have a vibrant growing economy, whether it's nominal or real, doesn't really matter. Any economic growth will lead to a bidding war to get access to the economic potential of those cities. And so the, you know, there's a lot of talk about the bubble economy and that's all put on the Fed. It's all put on the banks that they're feeding this bubble. Every, all the assets are overpriced because they keep feeding a bubble. Um, 
the 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 source of the bubble is that there's an inevitable bidding war for assets that give you access to those cities and until we solve that problem that's the sign of a of actually an economy that's running normal in the second best state so uh, what we've been doing is trying to avoid running an economy in the second best states because we're we're afraid of the bubble that's inevitable in that context. So we're running in the third best state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or for, yeah, or so, fourth best. Yeah, <laughs> depends yeah, where you're from. Yeah. So you know that urban housing problem is that you know that's a tough nut to crack and I don't know how we do that. That's a complicated topic. But that is topic. the key problem though. That's the key problem. But the easy thing, you know, the easy thing that comes once you take this framework into mind, you know, if we can get a regime shift in the framework we use to see this period the easy problem to solve is let's just stop beating ourselves up over it to, you know, to avoid the, the signal of a, of a bubble, you know, of a, of a second right. best economy. And that, you know, we see that the, the funny thing is all the conversations in the United States are sort of built on American exceptionalism in terms of the causes of these problems, the subprime crisis and banking deregulation, and all the, the GSEs. But the f- hilarious thing is the, the countries most like us all around the country, Australia and Canada and, and uh, Great Britain, you know, all these sort of other Anglosphere countries, they actually have more or less been running along in that second best economy. They avoided the deepest parts of the crisis. They didn't have as much of a rise in unemployment in the foreclosure crisis. And they, they have quote unquote bubble economies that, that people keep trying to blame on their local uh, credit markets, right? They're actually right. doing it right. If if you can't fix the context right. of these, so urban... they they are doing the best that can be done in a second best world, where you have these supply side constraints. So like yeah. you know, I mentioned, Australia, UK, all these places around the world that have quote unquote housing bubbles are really just it's the fundamental response to a second best world. Yeah, and so they all have to address this issue, this local housing supply issue yeah. that's the ultimate solution yeah. but you're right so you know let me i'll just sit on this note look i'm looking at right now in front of me a, a measure a graph of global house prices in different countries and they all have these booms a lot in new zealand australia britain canada and what what's unique about the united states is we're the only one that engineered a sustained decline in <laughs> yeah. housing prices yeah. So we are exceptional. We are, you know, American exceptionalism. We are practicing it, but, but it's a problem that's more fundamental than monetary policy, than the credit accesses and all those things need to be done right. But at the end of the day, we need to address the housing supply issue. So with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Kevin Erdman. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.